Welcome to Bet On It. It is NFL Week One, September fourth. We are on the eve before the Thursday night football games kick off. I am Kelly Stewart at Kelly in Vegas. Joined today by Marco D'Angelo at Marco in Vegas, Joe Ranieri at Joe Ranieri, and Teddy Covers, Teddy underscore Covers. Make sure you're following all of us on social media because we give out tons of free and actionable information. Gentlemen, we're going to get right into these primetime games because we have a lot to do. We've got to check in with Ralph for some TNA. We've got Prop Shop with Andy Lang. Are you high, Joe Ranieri? A new segment from Teddy. Can't have a sandwich game on week one. And, of course, we're looking for barking dogs. VR is going to come in last with some of that gold, and we're going to finish up with best bets. We'll start off with the Thursday night primetime games because the guys decided they wanted to talk about the other ones. But why? This is the best Thursday night game we've seen in a long time. Baltimore is a three-point underdog at Kansas City. Total 46 and a half, and I can hear the comment section already. Kelly can't wait to bet against Kansas City again. Of course I can't. Come on, you guys. Don't you remember I had Baltimore to win the Super Bowl last year, and they choked it up in the second half versus the same Kansas City team. I know you cannot quantify revenge, but boy, oh boy, does that AFC Championship game got to taste really bad in the mouths of this Ravens team. Last year, they led the NFL in rushing, and oh, by the way, now they have Derrick Henry. I think this is going to be a great game. And uh, we know Steve Spag's defense, well, it has struggled at times. And I know maybe you could argue they've gotten the best of Lamar Jackson, but I do think we see regular season Lamar Jackson, who is 8-2 and two against the spread as a road dog against a Chiefs team who's 14-15 and 15 against the spread as a home favorite. What are you going to do? That's right. We're going to take the plus three with Kansas City. I'm going to go next over to the Friday night primetime game. And my good friend, Teddy covers Green Bay on a neutral site, three point underdog to Philadelphia, Sao Paulo, Brazil, Teddy total 48 and a half. Yeah, this is a client play for me, but you guys will get it here for free. So thanks for watching better than it again this week. We appreciate your support. Of course, if you like this type of analysis, give us a thumbs up, give us a follow, give us a comment below all great stuff. Let's talk. Green Bay, and Philadelphia. I'm going to start with the Packers piece of the equation right here. We have Matt LaFleur, who's been an underdog on opening day four times in his five-year tenure with the Packers, and they've won three of those four games on opening day in outright fashion as underdogs, including an 18-point victory at plus one in Jordan Love's starting debut last year. Green Bay down the stretch last year. Phenomenal. All right. They have all the makings of a bet on team again in 2024. There's a bit of thought in the market. Ah, Green Bay, they just kind of got hot down the stretch. They weren't really that good. I'm going to disagree with that. Green Bay is an underdog down the stretch last year. 4-1 and one straight up, 5-0 and oh against the spread in their last five tries. That includes straight up wins over the Lions, Chiefs, and Cowboys. And the Packers for 2024, at least on paper, every bit as good, if not better, than last year's version. This is not a team prime to take a step back. Philadelphia is an interesting story. All right, they started 10-1 and last year. Since then, they're 1-6. and The lone win, by the way, coming against the hapless Giants at home on Monday Night Football in December. And the offseason. Well, that 10-1 and start, even that, we have to call that fraudulent last year. Okay, Philly won a boatload of games where they rallied from behind, stole one at the end. Things broke right for them and not the opposing team. They had some ridiculous fourth quarters to go 10-1. and Realistically, that team was a lot more like a 500-level team last year but meanwhile they're on a one and six slide the offseason been littered with published reports about the disconnect between Jalen Hurts and Nick Sirianni for the second straight year two new coordinators defense that allowed what 25th 26th in the NFL last year only 16 a lot more than Philly and I'm not sold on their cornerback situation I'm not sold on their pass rush I'm not sold that this team should be favored at all give me Green Bay plus the points Sao Paulo Philadelphia, Lambeau, doesn't matter. Right now, I got the Packers the better of these two. I kind of like the Packers here as well. Is Adam Trigger on the show? Because I keep hearing an iPhone vibrate. He would be the only one that would do that to me (laughs) on a show. All right, we're going to go to Sunday night. Prime time, LA Rams plus three and a half at Detroit. Total 50 and a half. And that's where Marco is going in this one. 
Yeah, Kelly, we got another primetime game this week that is a playoff revenge game. We know we talk about revenge and how that's the most overused term in sports betting, except when it comes to playoff revenge. You never forget who ended your season. So for the Rams and the Lions, you know the Rams are going to come looking for that revenge. And before I want to jump on that bandwagon, you know, it is the Lions. It's been a long time since they've had success and been able to look forward to the next season. Well, they finally had that monkey off their back, so to speak, as they got a playoff win last year, got to the playoffs and got the win. So they broke some records that had been a long time coming. I know our buddy Johnny Detroit has been a long-suffering Detroit Lions fan. So before I jump on the Rams blindly, I'm not going to do it being that this is a Sunday night game. That crowd is going to be crazy. Where I am going to go is I'm going to look to the total. And I think there's value on the under in this game. Because it is a standalone game, we know these games tend to have a little bit of uh, value looking at the unders. We know the public likes to bet overs. Vegas knows that when they set the line, they're going to bump it towards the over a little bit. So right off the bat, I think we have value with the under. Now, when we look at the matchup, here's a coach in Coach McVay for the Rams. He does it every year, doesn't play the starters, doesn't play anybody basically of any meaning in preseason. To me, you've got to come out of the gates a little bit slow and a little bit sluggish uh, with that. Three of the last four years, they have gone under the total for their game in week one. Being that this is a playoff revenge game and the two teams do know each other, well, I also expect it to be played like a playoff game a little closer to the vest as nobody wants to make that first mistake. I also expect the Lions to try to run the football a little more in this matchup uh, as opposed to last year when Jared Goff did have a great game against the Rams because the Rams are missing one crucial piece this year on defense. Um, and that's Aaron Donald has retired. He has been a mainstay of that defense for how many years? I think the Lions would believe going in on paper that they can exploit that. So with that said, thinking I've got a little bit of an inflated number, thinking the Lions are going to try to establish the run, and thinking that these two teams, because they didn't play the starters a lot during the preseason, might have that little bit of first game rust. And we know that uh, these week one games do have a tendency to go under the total more than over. Sunday night football, give me the under. And as I always say, when we're betting the Sunday night games, if I'm betting an over, I'm generally betting it early. If I'm betting an under, I'm betting it right by <laughs> shortly before kickoff when I can get the maximum number when John Q. Public lines up to start betting the over when they're drinking their beers and watching Sunday night football. All right, three-day all-access pass right now for just $49. Every NFL, college football, MLB, soccer, and, of course, UFC play. Your betting expert releases along with any other additional selections for three days, just 49 bucks <laughs> over at wagertalk.com. Last but not least, Monday primetime, and actually my favorite game on the slate, the New York Jets and Aaron Rodgers head to San Francisco as three-and-a-half-point underdogs, total 44-and-a-half. Joe Ranieri, what say you? Well, as the resident Jet fan on the panel here, I think that's uh, fantastic that you gave me this game because I want to throw up just breaking it down. Uh, it, the reality is this line for this game – has been absolutely all over the place over the last couple of months. Uh, opened up five and a half, six over the summer, and then all of the stories start rolling in. Brandon Ayuk not going to uh, not going to play. Wants to be traded. Trent Williams uh, threatening to hold out. Uh, McCaffrey with a little bit of a hamstring issue. Uh, the list went on and on. A player getting shot. I mean the distractions for the 49ers over the last couple of months has been crazy. Uh, this line got as low as three and a half uh, last week amongst Trent Williams trying to hold out. And then what happens? Ayuk signs, Trent Williams signs, nobody died. Everybody is good to go. The line is hovering around four and a half, four right about now. I think this is all going to come down to 
The 49ers struggled big time defending the run last year. Uh, They were only 20th in early down success rate, being able to stop the run against good rushing teams. And we know what Brees Hall and the Jets are going to bring to the table. And of course, that's going to help Aaron Rodgers a ton, who's finally making his long-awaited debut. And I don't count whatever the hell that was against Buffalo in game one last year as a debut uh, when he blew out his Achilles here. I think this is all going to depend on whether or not the 49ers defense can get off the field against the rushing of the New York Jets. If they can't, the Jets are very much a live dog in this one. Any which way, though, this game smells like an under uh, to me with both defenses, I think, ready to go here with their ability to be able to stop the run and get off the field. And nobody was better than the New York Jets last year at not only defending the run, but of course, being able to get off the field and not have plays get extended. I like the under in this one here, but there's a reason why this thing is back up to four, four and a half. Uh, The 49er money, now that everything is settled down, is coming back in. I still like the under more than I like a side here, but I wouldn't hate you if uh, if you took the four and a half points here with the New York Jets. Joe's got the current odds on the Jets because he probably has his wager talk odds screen open. WT.buzz backslash odds. The best free odd screen in the business. Now, of course, I've got these glasses on because it only means one thing. We're going to check in with our favorite guy, Ralph Michaels. There's the man with the pen, except I cannot take him seriously with those bent glasses. Uh, You remind me of my aunt or I don't know what. Bottom line, Ralph brings us actionable info every single week here on the Trends and Angles segment. If you missed some of it from the NFC and AFC previews, I highly recommend going back and watching those, Ralph. But it is NFL week one. So give me some trends and angles. We've got all the charts. Let's break it down. Kelly, I just want you to know the glasses, the suit, the hair, that's just because every time I'm on the show with my idol, Marco, I have to try to emulate him. So I just wanted to let you know that that is the reason. So, um, and I do want to say this. Thank you for all the bet on it comments. The one thing that did come out of this off season that when I was going through a lot of the reading, they're like, why the heck do you always have charts on wager talk today but when you get to bet on it you just throw out stats and you don't give us charts so we'll have a couple fewer trends each week but so you can visualize the numbers and see them i will start doing the charts for bet on it i prefer it that way so hopefully you do as well please do comment below if you are happy to see the charts kelly i just want to start with the most basic thing there is in the nfl week number one is it better to bet favorites or better to bet dogs. And I've done this on a couple segments and we've done, but since it's fresh in everyone's mind, some of this information may be a rehash to a few of you, but let's basically take a look. Look at that top line. Since 2014, if you bet every NFL dog in week number one, you have covered 56.4%. That's pretty damn good. But look at the next breakdown. Non-division dogs, 49%. So, hey, when you have a non-division game, don't worry about it. Bet the favorite, bet the dog, bet what you like. But when you have a division game, take a look. Division dogs, 36 and 15 against the spread, 71%. Take a look at home dogs. Division home dogs, 78% against the spread. Non-division home dogs, 41% against the spread. And I don't know if I've ever had such a disparity between the bottom two lines on this chart. A division home dog of plus one and a half and higher, 84% since 2014. A non-division home dog of one and a half and higher, 36% against the spread. So a division home dog, 84%. A non-division home dog, 36.1%. I'm sure... We'll be watching more bet on it where we're going to hear about some barking dogs. That's certainly those things that I have circles for week one. Yeah, we know we love those barking dogs, but now you're almost enticing me just to bet blindly every single NFL week one dog. Kind of like I should have bet every single under last week in college football, but I digress. Ralph, what else have you dug up for us? This is one that I just found a few years ago. You know, it's a long off season and I'll steal one of Marco's phrases. You made the playoffs, you're likely fat and sassy. You didn't make the playoffs, 
you have some extra work to do. So if we look back since 2006, Kelly, we're talking, we are talking 20 years almost. If you bet every non-playoff team from last year that is playing a playoff team this year, that's it. It's that simple. A team that did not make the playoffs, you have gone 58% against the spread playing teams that did not make the playoffs versus a playoff team from last year. If it is a division game and one team did not make the playoffs and the other did, 72.9% against the spread. As a home favorite, there aren't many teams that didn't make the playoffs and are now a home favorite. But if you did, like the Atlanta Falcons, you've gone 13 and 5, 72% against the spread. And take a look on the bottom. It's an away, there's only been one away favorite. But as an away dog, if you're a non playoff team against a playoff opponent, you have gone 61.7% in NFL week number one, dating all the way back to 2006. This is also a really another interesting tidbit, Ralph, because you're absolutely right. People want to bet on playoff teams. They want to bet on the teams that are good. Nobody wants to bet on the garbage teams. Well, nobody but me and, uh, well, a couple other a couple other of my friends. We'll leave it at that. Some of us like to swim in the muck. Last but not least, give us this chart. Well, Kelly, you talked about college football. You should have bet every under. Take a look. It is no different in the NFL. Joe Public wants to bet favorites. Joe Public wants to bet overs. The bookmakers know that. Let's see the over-under chart. This, again, goes all the way back to 2013. If you bet every under Kelly in week number one, you have cashed 55.3%. Home favorite, home dog, doesn't matter. It's pretty much the same. Division home favorite, non-division home dog, doesn't really matter. Take a look, though. Non-division home favorites are 42% to the over. Non-division home dogs are 41% to the under. And then on the very bottom, I wanted to break down those lowest totals of week one. Since 2013, if you bet every under on a total of 45 or less in a season opener, you have cashed 65.4%. So the over under record 28 and 53, 34.6% to the over. So again, dogs, unders, and yes, some crappy teams that didn't make the playoffs versus last year's playoff teams are the things to look at for NFL TNA, game number one. Ralph says, hold your nose when you go to the window or now you just pick up your cell phone to bet. So I guess it's not as embarrassing. We don't need any paper bags anymore. WT.buzz backslash RM. He is Ralph Michaels providing you with all the trends, angles, and of course, charts at Cal Sports LV over on Twitter. We're going to kick it on over now to our good friend Andy Lang. He has dug up some props for us for NFL Week 1. There's my little prop prince, Andy Lang, crushing it, of course, over on the Wager Talk Instagram channel, at Wager Talk, at Andy Lang Bets. If you're not following both accounts, always giving out tons of free plays over there. Andy, give me a prop for Week 1. I know we used to make it correlate with my best bet, and this week it just so happens to do. Yeah, I like your best bet, and I like Baker Mayfield to go over one and a half touchdown passes. Uh, there's a few secondaries that I'm really excited to fade at the beginning of this season. The Giants is one of them. My Indianapolis Colts is one of them, and Washington is definitely uh, one of them. So uh, Pro Football Focus and Sharp Football Analysis both have this Washington Commanders secondary bottom three to start the year. They've lost a couple guys, and while they did pick up some free agents, uh, they drafted a guy in the second round, they just don't have a lot of talent. Their first-round pick from last year was a little underwhelming. And last year, 13 different quarterbacks threw for over one-and-a-half touchdown passes against this Washington team. So if you were to just blindly play that in the regular season, you went 13-4. and four. Uh, Josh Dobbs was one of them. <laughs> so uh, any decent quarterback besides Josh Allen was able to get over this one-and-a-half touchdown passes. And when we go look at Baker Mayfield, he was really good on this prop for over one-and-a-half touchdown passes. He did this in 10 regular season games and both playoff games. That gave him a 12-7 and record on this prop. 
And Kelly, the Bucs only rushed for eight total touchdowns last season while they threw for 28. So Rashad White caught three touchdown passes, only rushed for six. So this isn't a team that just pounds the ball into the end zone when they get inside uh, the red zone. So the Bucs are healthy, finally with Mike Evans, Chris Godwin. I think Baker has a really, really good start to the season here. Take his over one and a half touchdown passes. Good to hear. Now you guys already kind of got a little preview of my best bet. You didn't have to scroll to the end. Speaking of scrolling to the end, wt.buzz backslash AL. Andy Lang, anything to promote? Yeah, we got our NFL week one pack that is up. That's also going to come with all of our futures that you can still uh, uh, play. There was available at all the different sports books. We're having a great year, Kelly. We're up 151 units in all sports in 2024. So we are crushing it. Clients are very happy. Don't miss out on any of these profits. WT.buzz slash AL. And let's get this NFL season started off with some winners. I love it. Andy is not high, but maybe Joe is. Trap sandwich and of course we have a new segment featuring teddy covers marco wanted to call it just the tip i don't know if i'm on board we're also (laughs) going to find out if any dogs are barking unlike the primetime segment this one is not going off the rails we're going in order which means we're starting with marco (laughs) d'angelo and as i alluded to marco there's no sandwich because it's week one so tell me nfl week one's trap game Well, Kelly, you are correct in week one. What we are trying to find where the trap, and for me, I'm looking for where the public perception lands uh, everybody on one side. And when you look at the line, as I do, you know, every week when the front lines come out, I look at them and I look for my gut reaction. What's the one that makes me go, hmm, really? That's the number? And that was this one. The Saints minus four against Carolina. How easy does it look to take the Saints year two with Derek Carr down in uh, New Orleans against a team, Carolina, that was absolutely pitiful last year? Two and 15 straight up. Every week we heard about what a disappointment Bryce Young was last year for Carolina. And yeah, there was a lot of pressure on him being the number one draft pick. And it didn't help that the number two draft pick was setting all kinds of records as a rookie, C.J. Stroud, as he was constantly compared to him throughout the season. Well, he's got that year behind him, uh, got another offseason, uh, mini camps and a training camp. I expect him to do much better this year, but that's not a big reach because he can't do any worse than he did last year. And I look at the Saints team, and this is a team that coming into this year, while some people might be high on them, I'm not. I look for this team uh, when we did our previews. This was a team that I said under on their season win total. I think they're overvalued. And I think Carolina, there's going to be value here. And going back to that number of four, yeah, it's over the field goal, but it's less than a touchdown for a team that only had two wins last year on the road. I'm going to go ahead and take Carolina uh, because I think they are probably the ugliest dog on the board to swallow this week, but we're going to back it with numbers as well. And I reached out to my good buddy, Stat Daddy, and I said, tell me if I'm crazy with Carolina. And he said, no, you're not. And here are the numbers we came up with. Uh, When you go back to 2014, division dogs in week one, doesn't matter home or away, just a division dog. They are 36-15-1 against the spread. Then we went back as far as 2002, week one. If you have a division dog that lost both games last year, playing with double revenge. That brought out a record of 38 and 17 against the spread. So I smell a trap here. We've got numbers that back it. Let's go ahead and take Carolina. I'm going to call it Carolina 21 20. Let's even go a little sprinkle on it, Kelly. Oh, I didn't, I didn't have the guts to do that, Marco. I know division dogs are the play week one i know it's a trap i don't know if i could sprinkle on that money line we'll get to the barking dog though at the end of this segment plus four i think i could do that that could be easily a field goal game joe here's a game that you don't think is going to be a field goal game Mm -mm. it's not high enough nope 
Nope, nope. And usually week one, you would think uh, I would uh, I'd be plenty high heading into the season, but no, not high enough in this game here, especially after listening to Marco take Carolina. Oh, my God, I was I was whoo, that was rough. Uh, let me say this, though, about this game coming up. Commanders taking on the Tampa Bay. I have uh, I've been saying it all summer long. I'll keep saying it. I think the prize of this last draft is Jaden Daniels, not Caleb Williams. And I think that will play out in a big way here this year. Uh, absolutely love what I saw from this kid uh, and the preseason. You want to talk about a quick release. We're talking about uh, in the preseason, we're talking about an ability to be able to get the ball out in less than two seconds on average. He looks comfortable in doing it. He completed 80% of his passes. He averaged 8.2 yards per play all of the reports coming out of training camp is they absolutely love this guy. The commander's offense is going to look night and day compared to what that unmitigated disaster was last year under Eric B. Enemy. Why? Because welcome in new offensive coordinator Cliff Kingsbury, who is, we can all debate on whether or not he's a good uh, head coach, and I think the answer is no, but offensively, when you look back on what he did with Kyler Murray in those first couple of seasons in Arizona after they drafted him, the Cardinals ran the second fastest tempo offense in those two years with Kyler Murray. Uh, their biggest problem wasn't moving the ball. It was being able to score once they got into the red zone and the defense was also trash. But uh, he basically took the last offensive team in every statistical category in Arizona and in less than a year, had them uh, pretty much double their effective rate in everything that matters offensively. Very similar style quarterback. I expect Kingsbury to do much of what he did in Arizona with Kyler Murray. They're going to throw the ball. They're going to move the ball. They got way more weapons this year than anything he had in Arizona. And when you look at the Bucks and Liam Cohn and what Baker Mayfield has done in this system, the key is getting rid of the ball quickly, and that's exactly what he has been doing. He's got the confidence now. The offensive line is improved here. The weapons are there, and we also have, as far as I'm concerned, a new defensive coordinator in Washington. There's new personnel. There is a big turnover on the defensive side for Washington this year. They used all of their draft picks wisely. As far as I was concerned, they built up this defense, but it's, it's going to take time to gel any which way you cut it. When you have two teams that want to get up to the line of scrimmage, they want to get rid of the ball quickly, good things are going to happen here, and I think we're going to get a ton of points. This opened up 42, 42 and a half. It's already up to 43 and a half, and Cal, I still don't think it is high enough here. I think explosive plays are coming. I think both these quarterbacks are going to showcase a little something. And I've got this thing uh, closer to 50 than I do 40. Ooh. Well, since you guys already know my best bet because you were following along and not skipping mm -hmm. ahead, I think that bodes well for me as well. I think uh, with Andy's prop bet, my best bet, Joe's over. Anyway, we got a new segment and uh, – We've kind of went back and forth on what we want this name to be. So I'm going to let the audience decide, Teddy, your fate. Marco, <laughs> you know, the guy who always uses promo code 69 something, decided we should call it just the tip. We had talked about steady, Teddy's stock watch, Teddy's stock tips, Teddy's tips. And the next thing you know, here comes pervert Marco just in like a freight train into my text messages. And I said, whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It is a Tuesday night. I'm trying to have dinner with my 82-year-old aunt. Anyway, we're going to let the audience decide the name of the segment. Once they do, we'll create a beautiful graphic. But, Teddy, before you give out your play, can you tell us what your premise is here with your specialty segment? Absolutely. Stock watch. Just the tip is what we're going to call it today. But the concept <laughs> is each week I'm going to look at one team. Either we're going to buy low or sell high. And it doesn't mean that for this particular week, I expect them to cover or not cover. We talk about the next month, really the next five games, we can grade ourselves. All right. The five games coming, we're going to sell this team or buy this team, whatever team that we're going to talk about. So that's the concept here, Kelly. 
uh, talking about not just one particular game, but in general, is this team an undervalued commodity in the marketplace or an overvalued commodity in the betting market? So that's where I'm going. I love it. Give me week one. I need to know. It's kind of hard when you have all of this data from the last few years. We have teams that made the playoffs, teams that didn't, teams with new head coaches, new quarterbacks. How do you evaluate week one and which team we're looking for and which direction you think they're going to be going in? So there were a couple teams. There were two sell highs that I was debating for this week. I decided to use the Bolts, the L.A. Chargers, as a team that I wanted to sell high. And the concept is really simple. This is a five-win team from last year that has gotten all kinds of love. We just had Bill Barnwell on ESPN calling them a playoff team uh, today, earlier this morning. You've had a lot of over money for the Chargers. You've had money for the Chargers to win the division in the AFC West if KC takes a step back. There's a lot of love in the markets for the Chargers because there's a some coach people have heard of. I guess some guy named Harbaugh. His brother's done pretty well in Baltimore. He's done pretty well as well. I went back, you know, uh, I'm a Michigan man, so I obviously am familiar with what Harbaugh did from the beginning of his tenure. Uh, he was good at San Diego with the Toreros. He was good at Stanford, though he did lose to the opener at Stanford. Uh, he was dominant in uh, San Francisco, two, two NFC championship games and a Super Bowl in four years. And, of course, he won his opener in San Francisco and nine years at Michigan. So, I mean, he's a coach with a pretty big following, pretty good track record, really good track record, and a guy who's going to get us a fair bit of hype, which is why the Chargers are an overvalued commodity right now. I get it. So this team had major salary problems in the salary cap problems in the offseason. They weren't adding veteran talent. They were jettisoning veteran talent because they're up against the cap because they had to play just to pay Justin Herbert uh, for the first time. All right. So you have a new receiving core. There's hope. But early in the season, we're expecting, especially given that Herbert missed a bunch of camp, we're expecting some chemistry issues with the quarterback and his rebuilt receiving core. Offensive line key. Harper wants to ground and pound. We get it. But again, it is a work in progress offensive line. They should be better at the end of the year than at the beginning. We look at the question marks on the defense side of football. This was not a great defense last year. There's all kinds of questions in the secondary here, which is bad news, especially because when we look at the Chargers schedule, this is one of the reasons why I want to talk about them right now. The first part of their schedule is as easy as it gets. You know, Vegas, Carolina, they got Pittsburgh, Denver, Arizona, New Orleans, all in the first seven weeks, all sub 500 level teams. They're going to be laying and laying consistently. I think there might be some good value going against L.A. early. I will sell Harbaugh and the Chargers coming right out of the gate. This is kind of a good segue-ish into a segment that we used to have everybody do. And then Marco gave out one point underdogs for the barking dog. And I said, (laughs) enough. Since we're redoing the show, I'm going to take the Barking Dog segment, and I am going to sell another team, and that is the Chicago Bears. Ooh, yeah, I know. I gave out their under eight and a half wins, plus 120, on our NFC preview, and I'm betting against them week one. I actually gave this out when I did some videos for Splash Sports over the summer. Four and a half and five was available. Now it's four, but we're going to take the money line as well. Good friend of mine, Kevin Boss, friend of the Kelly and Murray show, tweeted me yesterday, NFL teams starting with a season opener of a quarterback who was the number one overall draft pick. Uh, If you guys remember last year, his name was Bryce Young. This year is Caleb Williams. Oh, eight and one straight up since 2003. Ooh, week one. Woof. That is not a good look for a Chicago team that has a ton of hype surrounding him. And obviously so. I can't blame people for wanting to be excited about the Midway Monsters or whatever they used to call themselves. They've got a handful of receivers, DJ Moore, Keenan Allen, and the guy whose name I'm not going to try to pronounce. It doesn't matter. Lots of hype versus no Mike Vrabel, no Derrick Henry. Obviously, the Titans have moved on from Ryan Tannehill and now have a quarterback named Will Levis. And I got to see him in person last year, albeit against the Falcons. I told everybody he has some talent and ability to be able to run this offense. Now, their offensive line should be improved. If you guys remember, they drafted a couple of guys last year to help him out there. They also signed a free agent. So we'll see how this one plays out. But I do like the Titans plus four and a half. I get it. 
The Bears are flashy. They look better on paper. But if you look at the trenches of this game, I'm not buying the hype. I think Caleb Williams is going to be sacked a ton in this game and a ton this season. We saw it happen to Justin Fields last year. In fact, if that happens to Caleb, I think this low is going to be down because he's not going to find his mommy in the stands to save him in the NFL. Well, he still might. That being said, I like this Titans team. I think they're going to be scrappy, under the radar. Give me the plus four. Give me the money line. Before we get into best bets, it's time to check in with our favorite gold man. That's right. Ace VR, the Greek gambler. You know him of many names here on wagertalk.com. Let's see what that pot of gold holds for us. NFL week one. I love it. You look wonderful in green, Kelly. It does you justice. So keep that green on for sure. It's going to be a green season in the NFL. Keep in mind, this is only week one, so let's not get too excited. I know people are excited about teasers. We're going to talk about Wong teasers as the season progresses. But keep in mind, mean absolute error in the NFL, final score compared to the point spread is about average of minus 10.2 points off. That's right. We talk about how efficient the NFL betting market is, and yet, versus the pinnacle closing line, on average, they're about 10.2 points off the point spread, which is why six and seven point teasers don't work and is also why they charge so much big with 10 point teasers. But we will talk about how to beat them as the season progresses by teasing numbers, not teasing teams. Now, real quickly, before I share the gold, we come into the season looking for some teams to fade and some teams to back based on turnover differential and wins and losses differential. Here's what I mean. These teams got very lucky last year. Baltimore, Giants, Saints, Steelers, Bengals, Cowboys, Texans, and Niners. All of them had double-digit positive turnover differential. A lot of those, like the Giants, were plus six in differentials in fumbles. That's usually not ever going to happen because once the ball hits the ground, it's 50-50 who recovers it. So we expect the Giants to get a little less lucky, the Saints to get a little less lucky, Cincinnati to get a little less lucky this year. Now, teams we expect to get luckier, look at Washington. Look at the Minnesota Vikings, Atlanta Falcons, New England Patriots, Kansas City Chiefs, Philadelphia Eagles. All of those teams had negative double-digit turnover differential, which we should expect for them to get a little bit luckier this year. Also, wins and losses. Compare 2022 to 2023. Who improved significantly? Who dropped significantly? And who jumps out number one? We look at a team like Houston that improved seven games. They won three games in 2022, 10 games in 2023. You expect a regression. That's too fast of a jump upwards. We also saw that with uh, Chicago Bears from three wins to seven wins. We saw it with the Rams from five wins to 10 wins. Some on the other side, we saw the uh, Philadelphia Eagles go from 14 to 11. We saw... uh, The Chargers go from 10 wins down to five. We saw Minnesota go from 13 wins down to seven. Those teams, you expect a progression towards the mean. So you want to isolate some teams heading into the season based on the narrative and some of last year's data on who we're looking to fade, who we're looking to back. With that out of the way, let's talk about some of this gold that's come through. I'll share all the steam that I moved and let you know a couple that I have released as premium plays. I don't piggyback everything. Start off with the 457 Steelers. They're looking for the key number of three and trying to get even money on the big. We'll see if that happens. And then also in that same game, the total. The first group bet over 41. I believe that was Raz's group. Um, They hit those totals early in the week, but then we got the under 43, 43 and a half from an other group later. So it shows you once a, a number moves significantly and a total going from 41 to 43, 43 and a half is significant, you're going to see some take back the other way because these lines are very tight, which reminds you, if you don't get a good number, let it go. Only bet good numbers, you'll do just fine. A 4% play that I released was the Minnesota Vikings. I touched on them at the top. This is a team that I'm looking the back. They fall under both categories. They got very unlucky with turnovers last year at minus 12. Only one team did worse. That was Washington. And then also they decreased six full wins from 13 wins to seven wins. I think we see a bounce back by the Minnesota Vikings. And guess what? They're playing the Giants who got extremely lucky last year. In fact, they were plus six in a fumble differential. So again, we know fumbles are 50-50 when they hit the ground. This team got very lucky. Only 
they're tied with Baltimore in the AFC as having the best turnover differential last year, uh, excuse me, in all the NFL. So look for the Giants to get a little bit unlucky this year. Then move down the Panthers, Saints, 461, 462, who went over 40 and a half. I released that as a 4% play. I'll give you one more 4% play as well. That's a total. Titans, Bears went over 43 and a half. Here's some more steam. Buffalo Bills, minus six and a half, 469. Houston Texans, money line and minus two. Finally, 472. Chargers, minus three. And 478. Cleveland Browns on the money line and minus one, one and a half. Couple steam totals go over Commanders Bucks 43. And then two way steam on Panthers Saints. One group's looking for plus five on the Panthers, others looking to lay three, three and a half on the Saints when they find it. And it's the same thing with Commanders Bucks. One guy's looking to get the plus fours, someone else is looking to lay the three. Again, another reminder of just how tight these lines are, and more importantly, how important a key number like three is. It'll make a betting syndicate that we know is plus EV long term, take that hook just because of it. That's how key that three is. So be careful when uh, it's on that key number of three or seven. That's pretty much it for week one. Take your time. You got a long season ahead. A lot of these lines, all these lines have been up for weeks, if not months. So much of the value is extracted. Slow your roll. Pace yourself. You'll do just fine. Damage the rest of the way. Love you guys. Follow, fade, or ignore. I just want you to crash them and uh, keep doing damage, Kel. As always, we want to do damage, especially right out of the gate here week one. Thank you to VR for always sharing his gold. WT.buzz backslash VR. You can get all of his plays this football season. We'll see you in the college football edition there, VR, because I always look forward to that gold as well. We made it to the uh, end of the show. And that means it's time for best bets. So we're gonna go with the guy whose phone vibrates in the background the entire show first. Marco D'Angelo, give me your NFL best bet for week number one. All right, Kelly, we are going to look at a game where I'm not drinking the Kool-Aid. I know a lot of people are swallowing it. Sean Payton, Denver, 3-0 and in the preseason. Bo Nix is their quarterback. They finally found a quarterback in Denver, and everybody's jumping on the bandwagon. And they're getting six points on opening week against the Seattle team. No, I'm not doing it, and here's why. First of all, yeah, Bo Nix looked great in the preseason. Just remember, in the preseason, coaches don't game plan. They generally don't blitz the quarterbacks a lot, and guys are going to look better than they do during the regular season. This is a rookie quarterback. Will he be a good quarterback in the NFL? He's got the tools. Uh, he's got you know the mechanics. He's got the look. He came from a pro system in college football. Yeah, he probably will be successful. But will it be out of the gate? I don't think so. I think he's going to have a lot of learning uh, pains, growing pains. And going to Seattle, let's face it, Seattle, this field is one of the toughest venues in football. The 12th man is real there. They will put pressure on him in this game. He's going to get blitzes. He's going to get looks he didn't see in the preseason and actually have people game planning for him. Uh, the other thing that I'm going to be looking at in this one is Denver's history. Uh, I know they're improving in Sean Payton year two. This is where you'll start to see improvement, but this is still a team that's just six and 18 straight up on the road. Yes, I realize they're not a favorite to getting points, but I still don't see them being able to handle Seattle in this one. Remember, this defense last year, they had a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde type year. They were absolutely horrendous at the beginning of the season. Remember when they started the season, four of the first five games, they allowed uh, 26 points or more. And then over the final four weeks of the season, they were bad again allowing 26 points or more in three of the final four games. The only team that didn't score more than 26 against them over the final month of the season was the Chargers, who were absolutely depleted with injuries uh, at the end of the season. I'm not buying it. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to take Seattle in this one. I'm going to lay the six for them to get a big home win in their home opener, and I'm not swallowing the Kool-Aid. Maybe later but not this week. 
lay the points with Seattle is my best bet. I cannot wait for the comment section after Marco's breakdown. By the way, the resident uh, Broncos fan right over mm-hmm. here agrees. I do not believe either. And this will probably be my survivor pick this week. Not on all of them, but uh, my my most picked one out of the nine freaking survivors I've decided to enter in. Uh, Joe Ranieri, how many survivor picks do you have? I feel like you got to have like, I mean, we haven't even spoke about our team that our other friend Joe made us join. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, you're not in that one. CT and CT is. I'm so sorry. I can't even keep them all straight. No, no, I'm I'm in your 12 in Splash, so uh, between college and the NFL. So, yeah, no, it's good. We don't need another Real one quick, here. Real quick, that's a great segue to plug. Right now, tons of overlay money. Guaranteed money is one of my favorite things. Head over to SplashSports.com. You guys can go enter all of their guaranteed money NFL contests. I think it's like a $200,000 overlay right now in that Survivor, by the way. Yes, and – that, ladies and gentlemen, is what you call teeing it up. Uh, all right, let's talk best bet here, uh, Cal, because uh, I am going to go to Orchard Park, only I am not backing the Buffalo Bills here. I am backing the Arizona Cardinals, nearly getting a touchdown in this one. And you got to love the way this sets up situationally for the Cardinals. It's game one. Uh, This isn't game four or five where the schedule's lining up, where they've got to travel to Western New York. The weather is not going to be a problem. Arizona has their next three games at home, uh, and they've had all the time in the world to get ready and prep for this one, and I love it. And I think I love what Gannon did last year. I love what he's potentially got going on this year. This team played really hard for him last year, and they didn't have Kyler Murray for more than half of it, but they were an ATS covering machine last year. And I love the fact of what they did in the draft, addressing the issues on the defensive side of the ball, not to mention Marvin Harrison Jr. McBride is probably to me, at least in fantasy circles is going to be one of the top rated uh, tight ends this season. And it's not hard to figure out why to me, I think this is, Uh, addition by subtraction and the Buffalo Bills have subtracted a lot here this year they are not going to have their deep threats anymore you got Keon Coleman uh, which is going to be interesting seeing how he develops and I think they will be fine as the season progresses I've never been a huge Joe Brady fan although they did make an improvement last year when he took over in season calling the plays But I do think there is just as much firepower uh, on the Arizona side offensively as Buffalo. But again, you lost Matt Milano, the heart and soul of that defense, your middle linebacker. They lost him. There are other injuries that you have to be concerned about if you are looking at the Buffalo Bills. Curtis Samuel, not guaranteed to play this week. Marquez Valdez-Scanting, also uh, not uh, might not be available to play this week. So that's less and less options outside of a couple of tight ends here for Josh Allen and his ability to be able to try to scramble. I mean, any which way you cover it here, I think Buffalo takes a step back this year. I think Arizona takes a step forward. If you want to give me nearly a touchdown in game one in Western New York, I will take this. Uh, I believe Arizona is going to surprise some teams this year. I do think Buffalo will right the ship, but I do think it might be rough sledding early on for the Buffalo Bills, and I think game one could show that. So not only am I going to take your six and a half, I am definitely going to sprinkle on the money line in this one, Cal. I did consider this for the Barking Dog segment, but man, I'm not sure they can win outright. That is a tough place to do so, but Joe has the confidence. As always, Teddy covers. I'm ready for your best bet debut on Bet On It. Sure. Well, we're talking buy low, sell high today. So I want to talk about a team we can buy low on right now, and that team is the Atlanta Falcons. They're only minus three. You have to lay juice right now with Atlanta, but only minus three uh, at home against a Pittsburgh team that maybe might want to sell a little high on Pittsburgh to open the season. Let's not forget how bad the Falcons were against the spread last year. They covered only five point spreads in 17 games. All right. Uh, I mean, it was ugly, and particularly to open the season, but even dating back to 2022, when they started the season 6-0 and ATS, they closed it out 3-8. and So we're talking about a team that's covered 
basically over the last year and a half at less than 33% clip. There's no betting bandwagon for Atlanta. And this is a team that they underachieved last year, okay? <laughs> Very much so. How do you solve a team that underachieved? Well, you bring in a new coach, you bring in a new quarterback, a coach who's done it before, and a quarterback who's been around and is pretty good, Kirk Cousins and Raheem Morris. And bang. Also, you win a couple of tight games. Last year, just one and five straight up down the stretch and game decided by less than a touchdown. So there's reason to think that a team that hasn't had a winning record since they lost the Super Bowl, a team that's gone seven and 10 in each of the last three years, why right out of the gate, there might be some value because certainly from a personnel standpoint, both sides of the football, Atlanta's loaded. Make no mistake about it. Last year was a win now year. They didn't get it done. The talent level is still there. Pittsburgh's on the other side of the equation here. The Steelers, obviously, we know what Tomlin's track record is. You know, never had a losing season. In the last few years, they've been supposed to have a losing season, and Tomlin has got them to 500 or better. Eh, I'm not so sure that continues in 2024. Russell Wilson's looks washed up in Seattle, and then he looked washed up in Denver in each of the last two years. I'm not convinced that a third stop with another new offense is going to revitalize his career, especially considering Pittsburgh continuing offensive line woes. That is a really young offensive line facing a very talented Atlanta defense. I'm not sure that bodes well for Russell Wilson and his tendency to hold the football for long, long periods of time. Week one, what do we want? We want to take teams headed in opposite directions right from the get-go. I think there's value on Atlanta moving this way. Pittsburgh's headed in the wrong direction. Falcons minus three. Get it now. This line could well be on the way to three and a half. Mm. I would agree there, Teddy. Uh, Russell Wilson's a little uh washed mm. if you will uh except for marco d'angelo i is on the show so i don't want to hurt him too bad but i believe he did take pittsburgh season win total Ooh. under on, is that correct marco that is correct that was the best bet on uh, one of the preview shows we did on the afc preview show i do remember that that, that one had to hurt a little bit but i apologize <laughs> uh for bringing back up bad memories now it is my turn for best bets. I gave this one out in July as well. Mm -hmm. Tampa Bay minus four. Now it's three and a half. Oh no, it moved against me. Don't worry. It's not that significant. I understand this Bucks team is not elite, but this is still a team that has won the NFC South the last three seasons. We know what we're getting from Baker Mayfield, but we definitely know what we're getting from this defense. I always love taking good defensive teams. In particular, this one now has a rookie quarterback making his NFL debut on the road. Oh, by the way, I know I said this last week in the college football edition about Gainesville. Tampa is hotter than the surface of the sun at 4 p.m. when this game kicks off, especially on the non-shaded side, which is where the uh, visiting team so happens to stand. I do expect this team to win the NFC South once again. But it starts with this one. Joe said he liked the over. I expect some over money to come in, and it makes sense. Tampa Bay's offense has moments of greatness where we see this team start to click, particularly when Baker Mayfield pretends to be good Baker for at least half a game, particularly in the second half. I do like this defense, as I already mentioned. They give the seventh fewest points last year, and that is the only reason why I'm not tailing Joe on that total. I hate having two things in one game. I'm calling this one Tampa Bay 28, Washington 14. I don't think this one is going to be particularly close. All right, let's bring everybody back in. Normally we do a recap graphic, but you guys got really mad in the college football edition. So I'm just doing away with the recap graphic. You can tell me how much you hate me in the comment section later. I'm not forcing you to watch the entire show. So for Marco, Joe, Teddy, VR, Andy, and Ralph, until next week, let's bet on it.